All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. Today, we have the great honor and privilege of having Ms. Katya Brodison with us. Katya was diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as a 47-year-old non-smoker. Since then, she has had clean scans, and she's joining us today with the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative to share her story. Katya, thank you so much for your time and willingness to be here with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I've been looking forward to it. Awesome. So before we continue, we want to launch a quick poll to get a feel of the audience we have today. And just there's just two questions that ask how much you know about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. So I'll go ahead and launch it. And if everyone could take a couple of minutes to um, fill out the poll, that'd be great. Okay, awesome. We're getting some responses in. Thank you all for filling out the poll. It looks like a lot of people know a little bit about lung cancer and some people don't know much about it. So this is an op awesome opportunity for um, all of us here to learn more about lung cancer, and lung cancer screening, and learn more about the personal side of lung cancer. And to introduce myself and my team, my name is Priyanka Senthal, and with me, I have Drake Wong, and we are part of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, or ALSI for short. I just have a couple of slides to share about our organization. ALSI is a 501c3 nonprofit that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. And we're a team of over 200 students and doctors located across the United States. We do the work that we do because lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. Lung cancer causes about 380 deaths per day in the U.S. alone. Lung cancer is very fatal because currently many patients are being diagnosed at a late stage when the cancer has grown and spread to other parts of the body. Lung cancer screening is an effective imaging technique that can be used to screen for lung cancer and has been shown to catch lung cancers early. However, less than 6% of people at high risk for lung cancer are currently getting screened. The screening rate for lung cancer is much lower than the screening rates for breast, cervical, and colon cancers, which are about 70%. We believe that educating people about lung cancer and lung cancer screening is one of the most important and effective ways to increase the lung cancer screening rate for populations that would benefit from lung cancer screening. So far, we have given over 120 presentations on lung cancer and lung cancer screening to universities, hospitals, medical schools, and organizations around the US, as well as India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, reaching over 10,000 people. Over the last year, we worked with 105 mayors from every single US state to issue proclamations recognizing November as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we've also had the opportunity to work with several state leaders, including Arizona State Senator Leela Alston, who is a lung cancer survivor, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, and the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, Diane Primavera. In addition to our education, outreach, and advocacy efforts, we recently started a podcast series to share the personal side of lung cancer and provide a platform for lung cancer survivors and advocates to share their stories. And last fall, ALSI worked with U.S. Congress members and senators to draft and advocate for the first ever House and Senate resolutions, recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. And in December 2020, the Senate resolution was passed with unanimous consent, marking the first time the U.S. Senate has ever recognized the importance of lung cancer screening. ALSI has also actively been working with Representative Brennan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act of 2021. Lastly, we want to talk, end by talking a little bit about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using a low-dose computed tomography scan. This scan uses low radiation doses, is pain-free, and takes less than five minutes to complete. The United States Preventive Services Task Force, also known as the USPSTF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now, they recommend that people between the ages of 50 and 80 who have a 20-pack year smoking history or more and who are current 
or former smokers who quit within the past 15 years get annual low-dose CT scans. One pack a year is defined as smoking on average one pack a day for one year. And so 20 pack years can be met by smoking one pack a day for 20 years or smoking two packs a day for 10 years and et cetera. So if you know someone who might be eligible for lung cancer screening based on the criteria listed on the pre previous slide, please share the link given by the QR code so that they can contact one of our doctors about lung cancer screening. And finally, we want to highlight that there are other risk factors for lung cancer in addition to smoking, such as exposure to asbestos, family history of lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. And it is important that we recognize these additional risk factors because a large number of people in the US who have never smoked still get lung cancer. So thank you all for taking the time to listen to the presentation. And without further ado, we can jump right into the podcast. We have a few questions prepared for Katya, but we also have a Q&A session at the end where you all can submit any questions that you have for her. And this podcast is being recorded and will be shared on our Spotify, Anchor, Google and Apple podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel. So first off, Katya, could you please introduce yourself and share your background? Sure. Um, hi, Pat. <laughs> uh, I, uh, my name is Katya. I grew up in Sweden and I have lived in the United States since 1992. Um, I'm a librarian by trade and uh, I quit my career after my double cancer diagnosis, about a year after my double cancer diagnosis um, because I did not want to or could not work any longer. Uh, my mother died of the same lung cancer that I have uh, in 2016. Um, so it was a shock to me to be diagnosed in 2018. Uh, currently, I live in Iowa, but I'm about to move to Wisconsin next week. <laughs> so uh, I apologize if it looks messy back here. That's why. Um, so I live here with my family, my husband and my two dogs. and just enjoying life every day. That's great to hear. Um, could you please talk a little bit about your lung cancer journey? Yeah, so uh, I started feeling really run down um, in the fall of 2017. And at the time, uh, I was, um, I'd been a vegetarian for 18 years. Uh, vegetarian by marriage, as I like to say. Uh, and, you know, I was exercising, I was a half marathon runner. And uh, I just suddenly started being having a really difficult time, like going on hikes, and uh, needing to take a nap in the car before driving home from work. And uh, so I started going to my primary care physician. And I, I got kind of the standard runaround that women of a certain age get. And um, long story short, it wasn't until around April 2018, so about five to six months later, that I finally got a, an x-ray that then sent me to uh, bronchoscopy, uh, and it was confirmed that I had lung cancer, which was very shocking. Um, I, uh, they, they took, you know, they take samples and do the biomarker testing on it, but before starting treatment, they had seen something on my PET scan in my abdomen that they wanted to uh, find out what it was before starting treatment. And it turned out that that was a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which is uh, a stage two. And I've never had treatment for that other than the initial surgery. So that was another shock. <laughs> um, so I actually didn't start treatment until July, about, uh, I think it was something like 80 days after diagnosis. Um, but I have been on that treatment ever since. 
I am on my first line treatment and have responded amazingly well. And I'm very grateful for that. Thank you so much for sharing that background. I think it's it's helpful to have. Um, I was just wondering, you said that you um, the diagnosis came as a shock to you. I was just wondering what was going through your mind at that time and what were some of the first questions that you had after receiving the diagnosis? Well, so I had a very bad feeling kind of early on. Um, I knew something was very wrong. Uh, and I had confided in a colleague months before a diagnosis where I was like, I know something is wrong. Uh, and I think we were a little bit, you know, in denial at the same time, because what are the chances of this happening to a healthy 47 year old? Um, I did have some pain and things like that. A very slight cough. Uh, I suspected that it was cancer, but I definitely didn't suspect lung cancer. Um, that was the furthest from my mind, even though I just, you know, went through it with my mom uh, two years earlier. So it it is uh, unfortunate that you can't get screened until you're 50 and have a smoking history. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine um, how scary that must be. So what were the weeks leading up to your diagnosis like um, during those weeks of not knowing really um, what was going on or what was um, happening to you? What uh, made you aware of the fact that it could be cancer or did you sort of guess that yourself? I did guess that. Um, it was almost like being in a recurrent nightmare because I kept sort of reliving taking care of my mom while she was dying. And uh, trying to sort of get appointments and take leave from work without having to tell anyone what's going on because you don't know yet. Uh, and then also, you know, maintaining a career and relationships. And uh, it, it was really uh, pretty overwhelming. Um, and it's sort of, I would describe it as kind of walking around with this like sort of sense of doom, sense of impending doom, um, because you know yourself, you know your body, and you know when something isn't, you know, quite the way it should be. What were the, some of the first symptoms that um, you started feeling or some things that you felt were happening that maybe indicated to you that something was wrong? Um, well, as I mentioned, eventually I had a very slight cough. N you know, when you read lung cancer symptoms and it lists cough, I wouldn't describe it as that at all. I would, you know, more like a, just a little, like clearing your throat kind of, um, I was very fatigued. Uh, I gained weight, did not lose weight. Uh, I had pain uh, on my side here that turned out that that was because my lung was collapsed uh, because I had um, what's called pleural effusion, which is fluid around your lung um, that was causing pressure in my uh, chest cavity. So those were my primary symptoms. I did have some other really vague things, you know, like changes to my skin and hair and, you know, just things that weren't normal for me. And what kind of treatment options did you have? So uh, when I was uh, about to start treatment, Tegriso or Osimertronib, which is the targeted therapy that I'm on, had just been FDA approved that year. And uh, so oncologists were still giving patients a choice um, whether to go with uh, like a first or second generation TKI, like a fatinib or a lotinib or one of those, or go with this new drug, osmertinib. Um, we never discussed chemo, never discussed radiation. Um, because 
because my um, molecular like tests were like so clear, you know, that uh, this was my mutation, the EGFR mutation. Um, but I distinctly remember my oncologist, you know, I asked, what should I do? You know, would you go with these older ones and get like maybe a year on those and then go to the next one and get a year on those? Or do you just go for this one to begin with? And he said, if you want to win the war, you use your big guns first. And that has stuck with me. And that is, I think, kind of how I approach my care ever since then. Um, that's great to hear. And um, did you experience any side effects um, of your treatment? Oh, yeah, I have. I have a ton of side effects. I uh, got a terrible rash. Uh, it started within the first week, I would say. Uh, and it hung around for probably a couple of years. Um, my hair got extremely curly, which you can't really see now because I've cut most of it off, but it started growing in curly and weird. Um, I have weird, you know, kind of body aches, joint pains, um, lack of appetite, weight loss. Uh, my nails are doing some weird things, like they're falling off and um, very dry mouth or other dry, anything in your body just gets like super dry. Um, so uh, taken all together, it's, it's a lot to kind of get used to in terms of managing uh, the side effects. But I feel pretty fortunate that I haven't had uh, the ones that can really affect your life like very negatively, like constant nausea or something like that. So I think it's uh, it's manageable. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear side effects and um, comparing them to other patients that we've talked with. It, it seems like everyone has a different set of side effects and some individuals yeah. don't have it at all. I think it might just depend on the treatment type, but also even if you're, you are on the same medication um, or treatment plan, I think it just, uh, uh, it kind of varies based on each individual's body. Yeah, so uh, the way I think of it is um, like side effects are good, you know, it means it's working because your body is responsive and reactive to the medication. So you get the good with the bad, kind of. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. Um, in what ways did your life change after being diagnosed with lung cancer? Um, well, I, I have to say, I've been very open about it uh, from pretty early on uh, because I don't think you can get the support you need if you don't tell people what's wrong. Uh, I, so I, I, you know, decided I wanted to continue working while I could. Uh, so I did that. Uh, it was a tremendous strain on my uh, marriage. Uh, we decided to have couples counseling and I recommend that to everyone who has cancer diagnosis because critical illness doesn't really make relationships better. Uh, and my friends really rallied around me. Um, my friends and family really rallied around me and I had a lot of support, a lot of people who were willing to take me to appointments and things like that. Um, and it was fine for a while, but I got to a point where, you know, I had to think about, do, do I want to spend the rest of my time in library middle management, you know, probably not. And it just between that and all my medical appointments, I just think it be it was a little unfair to my place of work that I was gone so much, you know, instead like it created a problem for other people at work. So I just decided uh, to go on disability about a year. Uh, year or so after my diagnosis and just be full-time retired as I like to call it 
uh, and that's been really helpful. You know, it, it, you get to a point where you have to kind of do something to reduce stress. And for me, that was, you know, stop working and like focus on quality of life rather than other aspects. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think we see so many um, similarities with our past interviewees that um, once diagnosed with cancer, they want to live life to the fullest and um, surround themselves with family and love. And um, I think it's great that you found what works for you. Um, so <laughs> congrats on that. Um, but you mentioned earlier that you were diagnosed with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. How did you manage having multiple care teams and how did you ensure communication between the care teams? Yeah, that's been a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so I have from the beginning, uh, or I should say as soon as possible, when I got better insurance than my initial insurance, um, had a, two separate oncologists because I, you know, a lung cancer guy, he's like, he's all about the lungs, you know, he doesn't care about lymphoma. So I was able to actually have oncologists that have clinic on the same day. So that's been my goal. <laughs> so I can go, you know, one day and do everything. And then of course they share uh, portals where they share information with each other. And my, it just, my battery of blood work is just a little longer than like a normal lung cancer patients, just because we have the immunomarkers in there as well for the lymphoma. Um, but I, so I see my oncologist now, my lung cancer oncologist about every five months and lymphoma, even, you know, maybe every other time, every five months, so every 10 months, because uh, it's not really doing much. Could you talk a little bit more about what the timeline looked like? Um, do you receive your lung cancer diagnosis first or your diagnosis for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? And how did you feel when you received that second cancer diagnosis? Uh, I got my lung cancer diagnosis on May 1st, 2018. And that was the morning after bronchoscopy. I had bronchoscopy the day before. And so then probably, I think that same week I had a PET scan and uh, they wanted to see what this thing in my abdomen was, but it wasn't really like a biopsy type of situation. It was more like exploratory abdominal surgery because it was fairly large. And um, so I had that surgery, I wanna say it was like June 6th, about five weeks after my initial lung cancer diagnosis. And so then the following day, we find out that that was lymphoma. And um, that felt a bit dire at the time, you because know, I was like, I have lung cancer and now I have cancer of like immune, the immune system. So how is my immune system going to beat this, you know, or yeah. So I found out, you know, that it wasn't that bad. Like the lymphoma isn't that severe uh, and it's been behaving very well. So I've, I've, I keep an eye on it. It's in the back of my mind, but I'm not, uh, it's not the focus for my healing. How did you maintain uh, motivation, hope, and strength throughout your journey? Um, did you mentioned earlier that uh, you retired earlier and you surrounded yourself with family and other things that you love, but did you have any other strategies? Yeah, I, so I stayed pretty active. I had one dog at the time, now I have two. So that gets me up and out of the house every day. Um, I've always been pretty active in my life. Uh, uh, I also joined support groups immediately. That's been very, very important. Uh, I think kind of learning from each other and supporting each other takes a little bit of the weight off your, you know, your thoughts kind of go to other people. Right. 
and not so much on yourself. I also volunteer for an organization called Immerman Angels, where I um, do peer support to people who have recently been diagnosed with cancer or who have recently lost, who are caregivers since I've done both. Um, and those kind of things keep me going. Uh, there is also a couple of other causes that I'm involved in that might not, this might not be the right forum for that to talk about that, so I'm not going to. But it, I think staying active and like, I'd be mad as hell. Like I'm mad, you know, I got angry and I think that's fine. Where are we now um, in terms of your lung cancer journey and maybe what does the future hold um, for you? Yeah, right now it's it's kind of weird, you know, because I've I think I've outlived my life expectancy triple. I think I'm yeah. And uh my scans get kind of pushed. We usually push them out a month longer, you know, if my scans are good. And it, it's it's strange, you know, because you're like, but what's gonna happen? You know, it feels weird. Um, but you have to believe that, or I believe that I can tell if I'm getting sick again, you know, I have to believe that that's what's going to happen. You know, if it happens, I'm going to be able to tell and we'll strength, like change strategies at that time. Um, the future for me, I think looks great. You know, I feel fine. Uh, I do the things I want. I'm fortunate enough to have a supportive husband and supportive family. Um, and I, I try to do all the things I used to do before I had cancer, you know, within kind of COVID safe limits. Uh, so, you know, we go out, we go to shows, we go to plays, we go to concerts, we, you know, go hiking, go traveling, move to another state, you know? It's, uh, that's the trajectory I'm on. That's why I decided to stop working was so I can do those things. Uh, and I don't really see that changing anytime soon. Well, that's um, so inspiring to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, it might, some patients have said that it feels like they've lost control of their life when they're first diagnosed with cancer, but um, it's just so great to hear that, you know, th that there are opportunities to, you know, get back in control, continue doing what you loved before. So it's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Great. And um, going a little bit back to your um, diagnosis, how was the process of scheduling a CT scan and actually getting it? That was a bit, I mean, that was a bit hard. Um, so I lived on the West Coast at the time. And so one of the things they do there, which I don't know if they do here in the Midwest or on the East Coast, uh, is you have to deal with the whole tuberculosis testing before they, like, it's just one more of these steps you have to get through before they let you have a CT scanner or an x-ray. And I was very angry about that and did not complete that test. And uh, it was, it, it was hard to, to get it, you know, it's eventually he agreed to a chest x-ray when I was like, but think about my mom, you know, I do have a cancer history in my family. Um, but it, he did go through all the steps that you're supposed to take first. So it's like, you know, the, the x-ray, the blood work, the TB test, then the CT scan, and then the bron bronchoscopy after that. Um, and then I had another biopsy after that and draining my lung and all this business. And um, it was hard to get. You know, I mean, I understand him that that wouldn't be the first thing you would think uh, for a patient like me. 
but you know, maybe you need to be a little bit more of a risk taker as a primary care physician sometimes and really like go to bat for your patient. And what motivates you to share your lung cancer story publicly? Um, I think a lot of that has to do with my mom. She was very private about um, her uh, diagnosis. You know, the closest people knew, but there were people who came to her funeral who didn't get a chance to say goodbye because she didn't tell them that she was sick. Uh, and I did not want it to go that way for me. Uh, one of my biggest challenges after diagnosis was separating my outcome from hers because she was diagnosed and died within eight months. Um, and I obviously did not want that. So I decided to just be open, uh, try to advocate for myself, try to educate people about radon, for example, uh, you know, other screenings, like uh, we have a, the leader of, of our support group here in Iowa. She says, the older you get, the more screenings you need not the fewer screenings. So it's funny that they have the upper limit of 80 years old on the lung cancer screening right now, because I think they shouldn't. And I don't think it should be 50. And I don't think it should be smoking history within 15 years. I mean, neither me or my mom would fit into the current lung cancer screening protocol because she quit smoking 35 years before she got lung cancer. I think you bring up such a such an important point because um, while the lung cancer screening guidelines right now might might help guide who should be getting screened, I think it does miss a large portion of individuals. Like as we mentioned in the beginning of the um, podcast, about ten to twenty percent of individuals diagnosed with lung cancer are never smokers, and the screening guidelines require you to have a pretty heavy smoking history, and yeah. especially. When we look at minority individuals, um, right now, almost um, a considerable percentage of African American individuals who are diagnosed with lung cancer would not have met the lung cancer screening criteria, like um, like you said, your mom didn't meet it. So, I think definitely research in this area is needed, and one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because there are other risk factors for lung cancer, like radon exposure and um, and also familial. Um, the risk of lung cancer, but it's just hard to quantify those other risk factors um, when compared to quantifying um, smoking history or something like that. So, um, but I, I definitely agree with you. I think this is, it's important that we raise awareness about these other risk factors and um, educate communities that are maybe have a greater percentage of individuals diagnosed with lung cancer that aren't meeting the lung cancer screening criteria. But we're just hoping that soon we'll be able to maybe through risk, um, lung cancer risk prediction models, we'll be able to develop a better better way to identify high-risk individuals. Yeah, I, I mean, I know so many people, particularly women uh, my age, who are diagnosed in their 40s. And, you know, none of them are smokers. It's uh, it's very surprising, you know. I don't I don't think you're ever gonna come gonna come across a someone who's not surprised by a diagnosis like that. Right. So we talk a little bit about um, lung cancer screening, but um, do you believe there are any other current challenges that the lung cancer community faces? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think survivorship research is an area that they really need to start uh, working on a little bit more uh, because of the drugs that they're developing are keeping us alive, you know, for quite a lo lot longer than um, previously. And the long-term medication use uh, affects your body in other ways. So your kidneys and your liver you start having problems with those things. You start having like heavy metal deposits in your brain because of contrast fluid. So uh, it's not just about quality of life for survivors, but there are also these real uh, risks that can turn into other health problems or other cancers, for example. Um, 
So that's an area I would like to see um, more research in. Uh, I would like to see more about mental health being included as a kind of, a, I don't know what to call it, but, but a way to evaluate a patient. Um, you know, you're not just like physically disabled, but you can be, your mental health can be severely impacted and you can be very mentally like dysfunctional, you know, for a while because of the anxiety that it causes and the depression. So um, that's two areas that I would like to see them focus on. Yeah, those are really important points. Thank you for bringing them up. Um, in terms of advice, what advice do you um, give someone who's newly diagnosed with lung cancer? My first piece of advice is to get a second opinion. I think if you're ever diagnosed with a critical illness, you should always do yourself a favor and get a second opinion. Uh, I think it's really, really important. I also would say it's really important for you to get treatment at a nationally uh, ranked cancer institute, a research institute. Um, and get ready to advocate you know, you drive your care. You don't sit around and wait for the oncologist to tell you what you're gonna do. Like you tell the oncologist, these are my goals for my treatment. How do we get there? And if your oncologist isn't on your side, you know, fire them, get a new one. Uh, you, it's your life, you know, do you wanna keep it? Or are you just gonna like be like, here, take it. You know, you take over and tell me how to live it. I just don't think that that's um, helpful. Um, as a caregiver yourself, um, what advice do you have for someone newly diagnosed or um, who has recently lost someone to uh, lung cancer? Uh, give it time. You know, it takes time. Uh, Grieving is, is a really difficult process and that can, I think it can cause a lot of sort of health problems for you um, if you don't deal with it appropriately. Uh, I think grief counseling is a really good idea for people or medication support. I, uh, I hope that caregivers feel um, that that us patients are thankful, and you know we may not say that every day, but we're very thankful for the care that we get. And as a caregiver, I thought it felt, you know, obviously it's difficult and challenging, but it does feel right, and in some ways it felt like an honor to be able to be there in that way for someone else. Uh, it's hard to look for those moments when you're in the middle of it, but you know, hindsight, I feel like those things uh, kind of pop out as, as things that uh, I took away from that experience. A lot of patients talk about how important self-reflection is. And so you just touched upon that um, here. Yeah. Um, I guess, what are you looking forward to in either the upcoming months or upcoming years? Uh, I, I'm looking forward to, I just saw my friend just logged on. Uh, I'm looking forward to going to, uh, on a cruise to Alaska next year. Uh, I'm looking forward to moving into my new home in some ways, even though it's going to be really hard. Uh, I'm looking forward to winter, you know, like I want some snow, you know, summer is nice, but like give me snow. Uh, I'm looking forward to like big and small things. I want to learn how to kayak. You know, I want to go camping with my camper. I want to, you know, teach the dogs new tricks. I want to go across the country and see my daughter where she lives in Washington. 
Um, it's there is always something to look forward to. I think uh, if you you know sometimes you have to look really hard, but I think it's there. Uh, that's great to hear. Um, great to hear that you have so many things planned and are looking forward to. But thank you so much, Katya, for sharing or for taking time out of your day to share your story with us. Um, now I would like to open the floor for our participants to ask you any questions they have regarding you or your story and if you feel comfortable answering them. So if you guys would like to ask Katya a question, please put it in chat or unmute. I received a question from the audience. They ask, um, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed anything with regard to your cancer care? No, uh, not with my care, uh, other than everyone telling me to get um, my vaccinations and my um, boosters. Uh, it didn't change, you know, I, it didn't affect my appointments uh, or any of those things uh they did tell me to be extra careful just because of the double uh diagnosis and um i mean i was first two years i was extremely careful did not go anywhere ever <laughs> so uh i i i would, did not experience any of the problems that people had with delayed appointments or you know they don't have contrast fluid or you know any of not enough nurses or you know any of those things I, I was able to access my care um I also just received one um how did you gather all the information that might be needed to have a strong understanding of your diagnosis um, starting from just learning about lung cancer jargon that doctors might be using um, when talking with you? Well, so I think I started out ahead a little bit just because I had gone through it with mom. You know, as much information I, as I can get, you know, I just don't think that there is such a thing as information overload. You just get it all in and then you, you work through it. <laughs> I also received um, another one. Um, the person asks, having cancer changes so much about life in general. What advice do you have for people post-cancer as far as being able to live a full life once more? Um, well, I think it depends on what kind of cancer you have, right? So I don't think of myself as being post-cancer. I will never be post-cancer. I just live with cancer. Um, I, I really believe in better living through chemistry. And I think getting medication support for your anxiety and depression is crucial to being able to turn, turn things around if you're finding yourself in like that really deep, dark place. Uh, and joining a support group or finding someone to talk to, whether it's like a friend or a chaplain or you know, stranger on the internet or whatever, you need, I, I really recommend that people talk about it because it gives you a better understanding of not only the landscape of the illness, but your own feelings about it. Verbalizing it, I think gives you a lot of self-awareness. Your friend Deb just asked a question in chat and it's, which one of your cancer support group friends will you miss the most? <laughs> uh, Deb, I'll, I'll miss Deb the most. That's not a fair question. I'm still gonna participate even though I'm moving to Wisconsin. That's awesome, that's so sweet. And just as a follow-up to that, um, maybe what are some of the advocacy or support groups that you found the most helpful? Sorry, say it again. Uh, what are some of the advocacy or support groups that you found the most helpful? Are there like any particular organizations that really helped? I, I find the ones that have been um, supported by the local uh, clinic, uh, they have been the best. Uh, I have tried a few kind of nas more national 
like the GoTo Foundation or um, Inspire or, you know, those those kind of ones. And I, I just feel like they're a little bit too um, uh, anonymous, I guess. I like the personal connection that I can get with people that are local to me. Great. And then um, just the last what, last question from me. Um, I just wanted to ask, what is one word that you would use to sum up your lung cancer journey? <laughs> Complicated. <laughs> Complicated. Yeah, I, I can't imagine, but yeah, I think that's a very accurate word. <laughs> Great. Um, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. Again, thank you so much, Katya, for your willingness to share your story and perspective on many of the pressing issues in the lung cancer community. We really appreciate the work that you're doing to help raise awareness um, about lung cancer. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining our podcast. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming podcasts and events, which will be listed on our website, www.lc.org. We also encourage you to join our monthly newsletter where we share updates on upcoming events within our organization. Uh, please fill out this Google form and chat if you'd like to be added to our mailing list. Um, and before we end this, we would like to offer a brochure highlighting some key information about lung cancer and lung cancer screening. If you find this helpful of anyone who might benefit from the information included in the brochure, um, feel free to share it. And thank you and have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Kai. It was a pleasure talking with you.